Genesis 2, 18 to 25. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not, a, was, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Good morning. I told you all that I was going to be starting um, a lesson. I said a lesson uh, a couple times ago. And we're going to be talking about the roles of women, specifically specifically the passages that are addressed in the home and in the assembly, the formal assembly. Here are a couple examples of what I'm talking about. We'll only read one of each. 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 3 through 5, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in that passage. And my f first plan was to go through this text and text like this one to see what the Bible has to say about this subject, specifically the first part, the head of a wife is her husband. I got another example for you, not just in the marriage relationship, but also in the formal assembly. 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse 33. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, is there anything they desire to learn? Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And... Uh, I was going to try there in, in one lesson to try and uh, address some of the different things that are happening in the world around us. And not only the world around us, but some things that I think if you have a brain in your head and eyeballs in your noggin, you can see on the horizon that we're going to have to deal with. Not that there's some specific threat in this congregation, but you know good and well we're going to have to deal with it in, in the world that we live in and the way that things are moving. And I put that lesson together to go through each of these texts and talk about these things and uh, my, my own personal feeling was to just go through these texts in one lesson without any more explanation than that would probably create more harm than good and leave more questions than provide answers. And so I am not going to do what is pretty standard with me and go through a 34 lesson series on... Uh, on what God says about this subject. I would really like to do four lessons, but for the sake of being reasonable, I think that I can do three lessons. And I want you to understand something, and you don't have to like it or you don't have to agree with this, but what I'm doing this morning especially is, this is how I perceive this. 
I realize that not everybody will perceive this the same way, but the way that I perceive this is me being respectful to you. Because I try and preach and teach in the ways that I want other people to teach me and to treat me. And if I listen to a podcast or a sermon in a class and somebody says, um, here's a passage and this is what it says and that's it, without giving me the why, that's always going to be my first reaction. You can criticize me and probably you would be right. Because, you know, that, that should not always be my first reaction. But my first reaction is always, you got to tell me why. Like, saying the what is not good enough for me. you got to tell me the why. And so that's a lot of what I want to accomplish this morning is to go through and give some foundational whys for some of this stuff. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the whys that we're going to be talking about today are, this would be a good lesson for every other part of Bible study that we do too. A lot of the whys, why is it that way? Why did God say this? Why did God do this? A lot of the whys are rooted in his nature. And so when when we say things, and I try, I, I, I'm not always great at articulating this, but now would be a really good time, I think, to do that. When I say things like the purpose of our Bible study is to know God and to know what he's like and what he does and to know him as we read through the scriptures, this is a really good example of that because when we come to know God and see what he's like, it teaches us something about what he said and why he said it. I'm not saying it answers all of our questions, but for me, this is the most important thing for me to know about this subject. So uh, here are some words that you might want to know. The way that this conversation is divided up, this is especially true if you're going to, you know, uh, search it on the internet. These are the words that you're going to look for to search it on the internet or that you're going to read about it in a book. There's going to be uh, two sides to this conversation. One is going to be egalitarian, and the egalitarian is a word that means equal. An egalitarian position is going to say men and women are equal with one another, the same in all things. Um, what's the song? What's that song? I know it's a real song, but it's a commercial where I think it's a woman who sings, anything you can do, I can do better. Anything, You know what I'm talking about? There's a commercial that, that did that sort of. That's an egalitarian approach. We're the same. We're equal. Um, and so that's what that, that's what that word means. Then there is a complementarian approach. That's not a word that I use very often, but I do use the root of that. The complementarian approach is that men and women complement one another. That is not, I like your dress this morning. That's not what that is. It is, uh, here is, here is uh, my weakness and Becky's strength, and you put them together and we complement one another. That's what complementarian is. And so uh, that's where I'm going to try and, and, and go for, through the scriptures and say, I think that the one on the right, the complementarian approach is the biblical approach, and I'll try and show you that. Okay, so here is a chart. We're going to talk about God for just a few minutes. We're going to talk about God and his nature. What is God like? What does it mean to be God? The first thing that you'll notice from this chart is that there is one God. We are monotheistic. It's the thing that set the Jews apart in the Old Testament from literally everybody else in the world. We believe in, no, the thing that should have set the Jews apart from everybody else in the world. It didn't always work that way, but it should have. We believe in and worship one God. But that one God is composed of three distinct and individual, I'm going to say, people. Um, and the reason why I'm going to say people is because that's the way that it's described in the Bible. He is describing, in people terms, um, a person. And so, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You can see the three, I think, distinctly in the baptism of Jesus. Right, where Jesus was baptized, there is Jesus, 
because he's being baptized. And when he's baptized, there's the voice from heaven, God the Father, who says, that is my son. And when he comes up from the water, there is the spirit who descends in the form of a dove upon the son. And so here in this one story, you can see the father and the son and the spirit. We sang, I noticed it this morning in some of the songs that we sang, we mentioned the Father, Son, and Spirit, and you'll see it also in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. Just go to Matthew 28 in the last verses. Matthew, the last verses of Matthew, you'll see it where Jesus says, go to the nations, and one of the things that he says is baptizing people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, one God composed of three individual people. There are some things in each one of these. This is where I'm going to look right now. The Father is God. The Son, Jesus, is God. The Spirit is God. I'll do these as fast as I can. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father, God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father is different from the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we find out in verse 14 that Jesus is the Word who dwelt among us. The Word, Jesus, was God. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5 and verses 3 and 4, when Ananias and Sapphira decide to lie about their property, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Listen, to lie to the Holy Spirit. Got that? Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your own? After it was sold, was it not yours at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Listen, you have not lied to man, but to God. Those two things. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And he says, you didn't lie to man, you lied to God. So all three are distinctly um, God. What does it mean to be God? You can see some of the things about what it means to be God, that he was not created. He is I am. I just always have been. He's eternal. He will always be. That's different from us. We're not God, but God is all of those things and all of the things that you see up on the board behind me. And this is one of the things that I want you to think about. This is why we're talking about this right now. There are three people within what we call the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all our God, which is that and more. But here's the thing that we will say about that. They are all equally God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this point over and over again because I think the, the word egalitarian that means equal is a terrible word. And in the, in the best case scenario, it's just a bad choice. In the worst case scenario, it's dishonest, which is what I'm inclined to uh, lean towards. But I always go, Chad says, why do I always go dark? <laughs> that's, what, that, that's, what I'll, that's where I'll take that. But, but you know, whatever. Uh, I don't think that's that because uh, all three are equally God. One is not better than the others. One is not more important than the others. One is not more powerful than the others. There are three. And all three are equally God together. But within those three, there is a hierarchy. And I can show you the hierarchy in, in these ways. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. Uh, I think this passage is especially interesting because this passage is in the context of the man-woman relationship that we're really talking about. And so look at this, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. That's a hierarchy that we can easily understand. The head of a wife is her husband. We don't like that one very much. Our world doesn't anyway. And the head of Christ is God. And I think the implication there is God the Father. Not I think, it is God the Father. But look at this. There is, there is Christ is the head of man, the husband is the head of a wife, and God the Father is the head of Christ. And so even though all three are God equally together, 
The head of Christ is God the Father. Here's another one. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 21 to 23. Let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death in the present and the future. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Got that? There is a hierarchy within the Godhead. And so this is what I'm going to do. This is a chart. I didn't make that chart. That's the way that I always see it every time the chart pops up. But I did modify the chart, I think, to more accurately reflect what we're talking about right now. I wish that I knew how to do PowerPoint enough that I could make it, like, flow. I don't know how to do that. But watch this. That is probably a closer representation because all there are three who are God, equally God, but there is a hierarchy that exists within there. Let me tell you about this hierarchy one more time. Do you remember when Jesus submitted his own will to the Father in the garden? And he said, let this cup pass from me, but I will do what you want me to do. Not my will be done, but yours. And then if you, it's not just Jesus submitting to the Father, but also Jesus told his apostles, it's to your benefit that I die and go away, because when I do... I'm going to send, Jesus will send the Holy Spirit to teach you all things, to remind you about everything that I said. And so look, there is this hierarchy that exists. And, and I do all of that and say all of that just to make these last points. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all equally God, but they are also distinct and different and they complement one another. One fills in the gaps of the other, and you put them all three together, and they are perfect and holy God. Um, that, I think, is really foundational. Like, if we're going to have this conversation in a meaningful way, I think you have to know that part, because when you start saying things like, well, you're the patriarchy Living in the 1400s where people thought that men were better and superior to women and there is not this sense of equality. Um, no, that's, 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 I'm sure that there are people who think that. I was saying this this morning when I was talking to myself. Um, I was saying, you know, I don't know anybody who thinks that. And that's probably not true. There, there are ignorant people all over the place. But I, I don't know anybody within my circle uh, of people who, who thinks that. Let me show you why I think we can say that. The order of creation of men and women is not about equality. It's not an egalitarian situation. In Genesis 1 and verses 26 and 27, God said, let us, a hey, three, <laughs> let us make man... And I think that man is going to be humanity. I think mankind would be a good word there. And I'll show you why I think that. Let us make mankind in our image after our likeness and let them, plural, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, in this context. Let us create man in our image, male and female, he created them. And this is why I'm saying it, because we don't talk about this in the sense of equality. Both man and woman, I know, listen, I know that you... 99% of the people in this room are sitting here like this right now. Oh, we know. You have to know how to explain this, I think. I want you to know how to explain this. Nobody is talking about this in terms of equality. Nobody in this room is talking about this in terms of equality. Man and woman are equally created in the image of God. And here's another passage to put in your... Um, artillery basket, Genesis 5 and verses 1 and 2. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man, humanity, mankind. 
when they were created. So this is not about equality, but in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, there is a but, even though this is not about equality, just as there are different roles and functions within the Godhead, God the Father does this and the Son does this and submits to the Father and the Spirit does this and submits to the Son. Just as there are different roles and functions within the Godhead, so are there different roles and functions within creation uh, between man and woman. And you can see that in verse 18, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I like, um, I like the, the passage from our scripture reading this morning. I think it's a New American Standard Version that said comparable to him. I would like to use the word complimenting him. Let's talk about the word helper real quick. Because most of us probably, when we hear the word helper, think in terms of higher and lower. Right? There's, um, Mark, Mark was talking last Last week he was talking about his, um, whenever he was a welder, and he said there are welders, and then there are the helpers. It's kind of like I used to work, my dad was a carpenter, and I used to work with uh, him as a laborer, and my job was to help him, right? I would get all of his stuff so that he could do his job, and he made more money than I made because his job required more skill and, um, than I had and all of all of that kind of a thing. And so when we think of helper, probably a lot of us are thinking lesser. But you need to know this about the word helper. See, I'm telling you, ladies don't like to talk about this subject. <laughs> uh, when, you, when, when you talk about the word helper, the word is used 43 times in the Old Testament, and most of those times, God is man's helper. Would any of us say that he's less? No. He, he fills in where I'm lacking. He helps me. It doesn't mean that he's less. That's not what that is. There are a couple things that I think are really neat. I quote from these because they're accessible, and probably some of you have them right in your lap. The English Standard Version Study Bible helper is one who supplies strength in the area that is lacking the help. The term does not imply that the helper is either stronger or weaker than the one help. Fit for him or matching him or comparable to him or complimenting him, those words, is not the same as like him. A wife is not her husband's clone, but complements him. Fills in where I'm lacking. And vice versa. Here is the net notes on this one. Usage of the term, the Hebrew term, does not suggest a subordinate role, a connotation which English helper can have. It's not lesser. In the Bible, God is frequently described as a helper. We already talked about that. The one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. The one who meets our needs. In this context, the word seems to express the idea of an indispensable companion. I think you can see that word really well. An indispensable companion because God said it is not good that the man should be alone. And so how am I going to fill in this emptiness, this, this lacking I'm going to give him an indispensable companion. I like that word a lot. The woman would supply what the man was lacking in the design of creation, and logically it would flow that the man would supply what she is lacking, although that is not specifically stated here. I'm almost done. Be patient with me for just one more thing. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3 with me. There's one other thing that I, I think is foundational, foundational to to thinking about when we talk about this subject. The roles of men and women within the home, husband and wife relationships, specifically within the church, and, and specifically within the formal assembly. Um, the thing that we're talking about, listen, this is really important. The thing that we're talking about is not the curse. It's not the curse. It's not the same thing after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. He created the man and the woman, and, 
And then Eve chose to listen to the snake and eat the fruit, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her. And God cursed her and said, now you're going to have to submit to your husband. That is not in the text. That's not what we read. This is not the curse. It, the thing that we, I started with number two because that companion complementary relationship between the husband and the wife was God's perfect design from the very start. The curse in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The curse is not that men and women are different. That's not the curse. The curse, at least, and I should tell you this, only for sake of like full disclosure and openness. I'm going to tell you how I understand those words to read, but there are other people who understand them differently, and so I, I just want you to know that, that this is not like the one and only answer that nobody doubts or questions. That's not what this is. But the way that I understand the curse is God created the man, uh, and then he said it's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helper comparable for an indispensable companion fit for him. Uh, and so he did that. And they sinned, and God said, okay, so here is the curse. Woman, your desire shall be contrary to the husband, but he shall rule over you. The curse is not the order of creation. The curse is refusal to accept the order of creation. The curse is for a woman who was created to be in this indispensable companion role to say, no, I'm not going to do that. My desire is going to be for my husband. I want to be that. And the other side of the curse then is that men, instead of loving their wives and treating them as an indispensable companion, will rule over them that, that sense of, um, a bad sense of domination rather than a loving sense of give and take. Here's one that I think is worth paying attention to. Again, the ESV study Bible. These words from the Lord indicate that there will be an ongoing struggle. This is the curse. The curse is that there will be an ongoing struggle between the woman and the man for leadership in the marriage relationship. The leadership role of the husband and the complementary relationship between husband and wife that were ordained by God before the fall have now been deeply damaged and distorted by sin. This especially takes the form of an inordinate desire on the part of the wife and domineering rule on the part of the husband. And so uh, I think it's really important to see this, and the reason why is because in a lot of the passages that we're going to be looking at, both in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians um, and Timothy, what we're going to see is that Paul, yeah, in all three of those, Paul roots his words in the order of creation from the very start, which is going to tell us this is not a cultural conversation. This is not, hey, this is what some cultures do, but this is what our culture does. Paul says, no, this is what God made and what he intended from the very start. I think it's really important that we see that. That's the underlying thing. Everybody was made for a purpose to fulfill a role to accomplish something that the other does not have the ability to accomplish. And the way that I always think about this is like, let's say you need to hammer a nail. This is what Ryan does. This is what I always do. Uh, I got I to gotta hammer that nail in, but I never have a hammer. I always have like a cordless drill. And so this is every time. And I've, I, I've broken drills and I've cut my hand every time. And I don't learn my lesson. I well, I'll just use my battery, you know. <laughs> and it never works. And the reason why it never works is because the cordless drill was not created to hammer a nail. The cordless drill was created to screw in a screw. And the same thing goes in the opposite direction. You know, if I need to screw in a screw, I'm not going to take my hammer. Some people can probably do that, but I can't. I'm going to bend the, the screw every time because it wasn't created to accomplish that. And that's our question that we're going to need to be asking throughout this study is what were men created to be and created to do 
and what were women created to be and created to do. And throughout, we're not going to talk about this in terms of equality or better or more or less or any of that. We've already established that's not what this is. We're just talking about function that God created and intended from the very start. And so that, that is a huge chunk of the why. It's not just reading a passage and saying, here's what God said, do it. Now there's a, you know the why underneath it. And, and for me anyway, that's the best way that I know how to respect you. And um, to give you the same thing that I want to be given. If, um, if you're here this morning, I have not spent any time in this lesson talking about how to become a Christian or even why to become a Christian. But at the end of each lesson, we always have that opportunity. And it really is all rooted in the same thing, knowing God and what he's like and loving him. And what we do is we say from Dave's talk this morning, I know my sin and what I deserve. And I also know what God has done for me. And because of that, if you're willing to submit your life to him and hand it over entirely to him so that he can be Lord and master over your life. We'd like to help you with that this morning. Come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. Are you sowing the seed of